All right. Now, quickly, since since you were supposed to read chapter two this week, and I'm just assuming you guys read chapter two, and next week you'll need to have read chap, chapter three. Thank you, Garrett. Appreciate your the crowd participation. Uh, so, chapter three next week. Um, what were some things that stuck out to you? Now, if you have someone at your table who didn't read chapter two, that's okay. Give them grace. But maybe uh, help them understand what happened in chapter 2. So what are some things that stuck out to you in chapter 2? We'll get into a little, a little bit more details in just a second. Okay, so what were some things that stuck out to you guys in reading chapter 2 this week? Nothing. <laughs> Garrett gave me this. I'm trying to create the, uh, you know, the flow of the evening right now. So, oh, that was, anybody see that? I almost missed. Okay, here we go. So, what were some things that stuck out to you? Okay. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, very cool. Yahweh, yeah. Which, uh, yeah, you don't do any of this, the no vowels. So it's, yeah, it's a weird word. Yahweh. I had a professor who used to really emphasize that word, and it kind of drove me crazy. Anyway, so he wouldn't say Yahweh. He'd always be like, and uh, as we were reading, you know, Yahweh. And I'm like, okay, you don't, like, we get it. You know Hebrew, okay? Anyway, sorry. He was a nice guy, though. Any other things that stuck out? Yes. Yeah, so he said just the idea of being able to walk with God in the garden and how quickly just sin distorted that. To summarize what you said, I hope that's okay. But, but yeah, I, had a, uh, I think it's helpful to think like that all of the Bible might be pointing back towards moments like that where God and man are in unity with each other. Uh, and obviously that comes through relationship with Christ. But yeah, that's cool. Very cool. Okay, so the next question, I'm kind of stealing from the book. So it's in the first page of your book. And it deals specifically with problems that Genesis or the creation story might have with science. I'm going to keep that broader. And I want you at your tables to talk about what are some of the difficulties that maybe modern people, maybe coworkers or friends that you have, present when you talk about a creation story, in particular, a historical creation story. So what are some things that might uh, people might push back on when we talk about creation? Or in your own heart, you can be vulnerable at your table too, about difficulties for you with the Genesis and creation account. Anyway, okay, so what were some difficulties you guys said? I heard lots of good rebuttals to those difficulties too, which is great conversation at tables. I know you guys were talking. I could hear it with my own ears. Yeah, absolutely. So Garrett, if you couldn't hear him, he said that science in a lot of modern minds is the is kind of the you said leveling stick, right? The expectation that the Bible then has to meet in order for it to be true, which makes science an authority over God's word, right? Like there's some it's common some clear problems with that, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, well, so she said when when she was growing up, if you couldn't hear her, she said that it was common that the word just wasn't being taught. And, you know, there's lots of reasons for that for each individual church and each individual time period. But that is one of the reasons that we have a class like this on Wednesday nights, because we want people to know how to read the Bible when they pick it up. And so that when someone says, well, science is this and this and this, and I'm not hating on science, like science is a good thing, God created thing, but when someone tries to use that as a weapon against God, we can say, no, 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 I know the word, I know what I can trust, I know who God is, I know what he says, so yeah, that's, that's exactly why we have a class like this, it's hard work, we want people to know God, and know his word, yeah, be able to use it rightly. Okay, so, Genesis 126 says that God created man in his image 
uh, and in the image of God, he created them, both man and women, he created them. What does it mean for us to be created in the image of God? So that's your next discussion question. What does it mean for us to be created in the image of God? You're, the book this week spent quite a bit of time on that, so you should have some things to talk about. All right, let's bring it in. So real quick, TJ will come up right after this. Any, any thoughts on what it means to be created in the image of God? <laughs> that was great. He said, we didn't really talk about that. That's great. I appreciate your honesty. Yeah. Amen. Okay, well, great. I'm glad you talked at your table. That's the whole point of the first 20 minutes of this. I want to commend to you a book. That is actually, it was a large book, then a smaller book, and now a very small book. But this is called Christian Belief, uh, and there's a big book called Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem. It's very large. It is readable, though. Don't be intimidated by large books. That's all I have to say. And then he wrote, with the help of another professor, a condensed version called Doctrine or Core Doctrine or I don't remember. And it's, what? Bible Doctrine. Thank you, Brady. And it's still fairly large. And then his son, probably seeing his dad write too much, said, why don't we write a really small version of that giant book? And this is it. So it's really affordable, super helpful, super helpful. Just overviews of questions that we have, like, what is the word? Why does it matter? What does it mean for the Bible to be our authority? Things like that, this book. So I'm going to give it to someone as I walk back to the back. So just don't make direct eye contact with me. Uh, but anyway, TJ, a good friend of mine, TJ Yates, is teaching tonight. TJ teaches regularly in the Breakfast Club Connection class, uh, but also uh, is a tremendous friend, grateful for him. And uh, like Vicky said, I can uh, certainly confirm his knowledge of the Old Testament is, has been a tremendous blessing to me. TJ has been, at different times, my small group leader, my Connection class leader, but he's been a good friend, and his knowledge is uh, tremendous for how young he is. So grateful for you, TJ, and uh, yeah, take it away. Uh, so Vicki and Landry have, I think, probably built me up a little too much in my knowledge of the Old Testament. Um, I do genuinely love the Old Testament, and uh when I was about 19 years old, that's kind of when I felt uh, like a real desire to dive into Scripture. And for some reason, First and Second Samuel, I don't know why, but those were the books. I read those, and then I read First and Second Kings, and then I read First and Second Chronicles, and I'm like, I love this. Just history. It was so easy to read. And then I would read something like Psalms, and I hated the Psalms because I had no idea what was happening. But I, I do love the Old Testament, and I think that you guys talked about it some last week. The idea is that, <clears throat> uh, like, there's these two faiths, right? Like, we have Judaism, we have Christianity. And the one thing that both of these faiths have in common is we both hold the Old Testament as authoritative, right? And that seems weird, because the Jews worship uh, differently than we do. But the reason why uh, we hold it authoritative and they hold it authoritative is they are still waiting for the Messiah to come, right? Because that's what the Old Testament is about, the Messiah coming to save the world. And we believe that the Messiah has already come. And that's what we read about in the New Testament. So the Old Testament, Jesus is that fulfillment. And we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, I'm going to do the first three chapters of the Bible, which are easily the most read chapters of all time, right? Every January 1, somebody reading these three chapters for their Bible reading plan. So I'm sure that you guys have already read them this year. We're going to do those tonight. There is a ton of stuff that we could talk about in Genesis 1 through 3. I'm just going to try to pick one thing, and uh, I, that'll be hard for me, but... Uh, Anyways, let's get started. So I'm going to read <clears throat> the first chapter with you guys, and then I'm going to give you a couple questions to discuss. This is your reminder. Thank you, Landry. Um, but yes, if you have your Bible, <clears throat> you can open it to Genesis 1. And uh, yeah, let's get started. So 
in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without uh, form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And that's why most people don't believe Genesis 1, right? You read that sentence, and you're like, what is happening? And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, and which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth uh, vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds and it was so and God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind and God saw that it was good then God said let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the sea over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so God created man in his own image in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. <clears throat> and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to Everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for fruit, for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. I'm going to read the first three verses of chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. All right, that was a lot. Uh, and we're going to read all three chapters tonight. So to break that up, I'm going to give you guys a couple questions I want you to discuss at your table. You have them? All right. The first one, what do you notice about the outcome of God's work? And the second one is, what do you think is different between man and the rest of the creation? We kind of discussed that one already. I'm going to give you like three to five minutes to discuss both of these, and then we'll, we'll talk about them together. So discuss those at your table.
All right, let's talk about these days of creation. Um, so what, what does God make on the first day? Light. And uh, what does he specifically say? Let there be light, right? Uh, it's very important that we all understand that, and we see this in John too, right? Uh, where God is creating the world with his spoken word, right? He says, let there be light. And what do we get on day one? We get light. So, let there be light, and we get light, okay? On day two, what do we get? We get the heavens, which is the sky, and we also get the, the water and the seas, right? But he says, let there be an expanse between the waters and the waters, and that's that really weird sentence. And that's what happens, right? That's exactly what we get. We get the heavens, and we get the waters, on day three, what do we get? Dry land. What else do we get? We get, yeah, vegetation. And once again, let's read the structure of the, of the sentence, because I really want this point to, I want, this is what, <laughs> this is the most important thing in chapter one for me. Uh, verse nine. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And what's the next words that he says? And it was so, right? You see the power of God's word. What God says happens is going to happen. And it was so. The reason why I'm kind of broken them out like this is one so that we can, we can see. But you also see some intent in creation, right? Day one, we get light. Day four, what do we get? Sun, moon, stars. Those are related to the light, right? Day five, what do we get? We had, we had the sky and the waters. What do we get on day five? Yeah, birds and fish. They live in the sky and the waters, right? We get dry land and vegetation. The living creatures on day six, right? What are they going to eat? The vegetation. So we have structure in Genesis chapter 1. This is also kind of, uh, it's very prevalent in Hebrew poetry that you get structure like this. They would call this like a chiasm, uh, where the writer is essentially reminding you of what he's already talked about. So we go from, uh, we get our six days of creation, whether you believe that those are 24-hour days or spread out over lots of years, either way, we can look at this and we can see God created all things, right? And, he, and what did he use to create all things? His spoken word. And when he said that he uh, was going to speak, when he speaks that, that into existence, we get exactly that, right? Are any of you guys Bob Ross people used to watch his show? What did Bob Ross always talk about? Happy accidents, right? Or what'd you call them? happy trees, right? He'd make a mistake and he'd be like, oh, this is just a happy little accident. That's not what creation is, right? God does not say, let there be light, and we get light plus a happy accident. There is intent. Uh, there is no mistake in this creation, right? Uh, and so what do we see also in chapter one, where we see uh, God says something, it comes into existence, and then what? Yeah, he's pleased. It was good. Everything was good on day one, or in those first seven days, right? Day seven, I didn't put it up here, uh, but that's rest, right? And we need to talk about it a little bit, because throughout the Bible, we're going to talk about the Sabbath, and our whole week is structured off of this creation story, right? Where you have these six work days, because God worked on six days, and then on the day seven, he rested, and we have the Sabbath rest. Uh, the New Testament talks about the rest as if it, this is like heaven itself, right? It's the Sabbath rest in the Lord. So that's the only thing I'm going to say about day seven. Um, but then the other question I asked you guys was, 
uh, what do you think is the difference between man and the rest of creation? Um, uh, speci- specifically, uh, we kind of get uh, a little bit of that in, in verses uh, 26 through the end of chapter 1. What did you guys, uh, what did you guys say? Mhm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you get that specific wording right where he's breathing his life into them. Okay? Yeah, I like that. What what other differences do you see in the creation of everything else in the creation of man? He puts man over all creation. That's right. Yes, we will get uh, to that, but yes, that's exactly what he does. So we get, uh, we get land, they get put in charge of all creation, right? Uh, and there's, there's kind of like one more commandment that we see in, those, in that chapter one. Fruitful and multiply. So these three elements are important uh, when we go over covenants in a couple of weeks. There's three elements to all of the biblical covenants that we'll read about, and it's land, dominion, and seed, right? When God is initiating a promise with humanity, these are like the like, these are like the three things that we all find important, right? We all want seed, like this is our offspring. We all want families. We all want our, our name to live on. Uh, we all want land. We want a place to, to thrive and dwell. And we all want dominion, right? We all want responsibility. These are, these are three basic needs that we all have. And these are all three basic elements to all of the biblical covenants. And so even though we don't actually have the word covenant in Genesis chapter 1, I think that we have a model for one. And I'm not the only one that thinks that, but, um, but it, it is important that we talk about it. So these three elements, dominion, so God's putting us over the whole earth. Seed, it's the command to be fruitful and multiply. And uh, what was the other one? Land. Thank you. I was testing you. So, land. So, he gave us the earth in chapter 1. He's going to plant us in the garden in chapter 2. And uh, we're going to read that in just a minute. Um, So, uh, does everybody kind of get the point that I'm trying to bring about here? When we're talking about in Genesis chapter 1, God's spoken word. If he says uh, something, it happened in Genesis chapter 1, right? So, we're starting to get this this historical account that God's word can be trustworthy because he said, let there be light, and there was light. So we have a powerful word, right? He said, let there be living creatures, and there were living creatures. We're building a a pattern of trust. Um, Personally, uh, well, I guess I'll I'll save that for you guys, but... um, Yeah, so we said that all of creation is good, um, this can be a little tricky. I had this question for you guys, but I just was. Just... You raised your hand, so you did, Landry. Well, there you go. Uh, this one can be a little tricky, right? Because you know it's like mosquitoes suck. We hate mosquitoes. Nobody likes a mosquito. But here on day six, God's like He creates the the creeping things on the ground. Like this is probably a mosquito, and He says that they're good, right? There, there's really like the only reason why we're reading in Genesis chapter one that God sees that it is good. To me, what we're reading is is that God finds pleasure in that creation, right? In that specific uh, context, God has found pleasure in His creation. We'll probably read next week where, you know, the Tower of Babel. God then looks on humanity and He sees that they're not good anymore, right? Does that mean? Like, there's this, there's this change. We'll talk about that in Genesis chapter 3. But you have this, this idea that, that everything is good, um, and that is dictated by God. Even though I hate mosquitoes, God thinks that mosquitoes are good, right? So that's like a really stupid analogy. But what we're also seeing in Genesis chapter 1 is that the one who dictates judgment, the one who dictates um, 
the one who dictates judgment, the one who dictates purpose, is the creator. And so when God says that the light is good, some of you might not be morning people. That's okay. But when the sun comes up in the morning, God says that that is good, right? Some of you might be afraid of the dark. But at night, my daughter hates the dark. But God says that the darkness is good, right? So we get this pattern. One, when God says something, that's what, that's what's going to happen. And two, God is the one that's going to dictate judgment. And God is the one. Yeah, Willie, go ahead. That's right. A hundred percent. And and we will see this play out in Genesis chapter three. So that's why I really want to get your heads around that. We're running out of time already very quickly. So let's get to Genesis chapter two. But uh, his word is fulfilled and he is the one that dictates judgment and purpose. All right, let's read Genesis chapter 2. Oh, man, I'm running out of breath. All right, we're in verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was water in the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man created, the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of the land is good. Bedelium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gahan. It is the one that flowed from the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows out of, the, of, out of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to all the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. For Adam, there was not found a helper for him, fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its, its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. They shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. All right. So I got two questions for you to discuss at your table. I'm not going to give you as much time this time. Um, but these two questions. Do you believe that God's word is absolute? Uh, and discuss what absolute means at your table. And then would you say that you live like God's word is absolute? Um, and I'll give you a couple minutes there. All right. I'm sorry, we have to move on, because chapter 3 is our most important topic. So, uh, so what does it mean that God's word is absolute? Sorry? Completely true? Okay, what else? Unchangeable, final, what else? It stands on its own? Yeah, so... Um, this is, a, this is one that I think that Baptists are really good about holding firm to. And unfortunately, there are a lot of denominations that don't hold firm to this. Um, uh, specifically, what I think it means that God's word is absolute is that 
if I compare it to any other teaching that I ever have, or if I compare it to any other man's word, this is the one that should take precedence, right? So if somebody says something that is different than what God's word teaches, then I can say they are a liar, right? That's as simple as that. This is the foundation for what I should believe. That's, that's what I think absolute means. Um, and I won't ask you the second one to talk about it. But, um, but chapter 2, uh, you know, we talked about a little bit at our table. Some people like to say that there's two creation accounts. There are not two creation accounts. There is one high-level creation account. That's Genesis chapter 1, right? We get this overarching story of the first seven days of creation. And then Genesis chapter 2, we get a more in-depth look at the specific creation of humanity. Um, so there's really just two things I want to talk about here. Uh, there's a lot of really good stuff in Genesis chapter 2. Um, but there is something that really sticks out, right? Genesis chapter 1, everything that was created was good. In Genesis chapter 2, we get something that's not good, right? And so I said God doesn't make mistakes but he made something that was not good. What Could that mean that he's made a mistake? It really goes back to what I was trying to say about Genesis chapter 1. What it, what it means when God saw that it was good means that he has found pleasure in it. So in Genesis chapter 2, when man is alone, God is seeing that he does not find pleasure in that. So he wants to make a companion for man. So then that, so then that it will be very good. Um... I think it teaches us a couple of things about his character and specifically about creation. Um, I believe that God is the judge. Whatever he says goes. So if God says that this is good, then we can hold firm that it is good because the Bible is absolute, right? God's word is absolute. If God says that something is bad, then we could say it is bad because God's word is absolute. And so if God says that, uh, you know, it's bad for man to be alone, then he's the judge of that. Not me, not you. It goes back to what Willie's saying. It's not about us, right? What God says, that goes. Um, the second thing I think that is teaching us is that relationships are important. Because God saw that a relationship was good for Adam, it should be understood that we can know that a relationship will be good for us. And that doesn't necessarily mean a marriage relationship. This just happens to be that example. Um, but just relationships, community in general, right? It is not good for us to be alone. This does not mean that everyone is called to be married because you can be in relationships with people. You can have close guy friends and not be married, but still have that bond of relationship, right? And still have a good, um, good experience. But going back to, um, to it being good and not good, relationships are only good if they are practiced within the context of what God says is good. And so when we look at marriage, we get a very specific teaching from God that this is the context of when a relationship is good is when that marriage is between one man and one woman, right? So that is the foundational absolute truth of a good marriage relationship. If culture says, well, it can be two guys, we can say, that is wrong because this is absolute truth, right? So you see how this implication, we can see it in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. God's absolute truth that what he says is going to happen is going to happen, right? Second thing I want to point out in uh, Genesis 2 is now we get a spoken commandment to Adam, right? We didn't, well, I mean, I guess we kind of had like the be fruitful and multiply in Genesis chapter 1. But now we get a do not do. And so what does he say in Genesis chapter 2 for Adam not to do? Do not eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? You can have anything in this garden but that tree. Um, what happens if the man eats of that tree? He's going to die, right? So in Genesis chapter 1, we saw when God said something, it happened. In Genesis chapter 2, we get a warning where God says, if you eat of this tree, you will die. So what can we assume will happen if man eats of that tree? He will die because God's word said that he would, right? Does that make sense? We see the implication of how that flows. All right, so 
Let's read Genesis chapter 3 as fast as we can. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the trees that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its tree and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return." The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of the life and eat, the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work, to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. All right. I'm only going to give you two minutes. Uh, so I'm only going to give you one question. Does God overreact in his condemnation of humanity for eating some fruit? What do you guys think? So I'll give you uh, two minutes to talk about that one. All right, I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off. So does God overreact at, at Adam and Eve eating a piece of fruit? What do you guys think? Would you have condemned them if they ate an apple? You would have. That's good, okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter, right? Going back to what Willie said, it's not about what we think. God is the judge. He's the one that says that that's a bad thing for them to do. He's the one that decides it, right? I just really, I, I know I'm being annoying. I want to drive that point home. What God says, that's what goes. That's what it means for it to be the absolute word, okay? So, um, God created the serpent, right? Why does he give you the ability to disobey? I don't know. I don't get to decide, right? So, uh, I do believe uh, that we all have the free will to disobey God. Uh, and I think that God clearly gave that same ability to the serpent or Satan. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I think that's how we get to the fall. It's not that uh, it's not that that's outside of God's ability to turn his heart. Go ahead, Willie. No. <laughs> All right. I love that. 
All right, so, so we, we've been talking about God's word, right? And so what does, what does, uh, how does Eve tempt, or how does, the sa- how does the serpent tempt Eve? What does she specifically say to Eve? Yeah, she, she lies, but what she's trying to twist. She's trying to twist God's word, right? So what God has spoken, do not eat of that tree or you will surely die. That's what's communicated. Uh, and, and the serpent says, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman responds, right? And she says, she does know the commandment. Yeah, God says, don't, don't, uh, don't even look at the tree. That's not actually what God says, but I'm sure to fight temptation, they chose not to look at the tree. But then notice this, the serpent, you will not surely die. So now we get a comparison between God's word and the serpent's word, right? God's word says that you will die. The serpent says that you will not surely die. We get two comparisons. And which one do Adam and Eve choose? They choose the serpent's words. And the serpent also is challenging God's character because he says the reason why God doesn't want you to eat of that tree is because he doesn't want you to be like him, right? As if God is withholding something from them. Remember, Genesis 1 and 2, what has God given man and woman? Dominion, seed, land, right? He's given them life. He's given them a covenant relationship. And the serpent is here to tell Eve, God is withholding from you. And that's what causes her to doubt, right? Um, I know I'm out of time. All right, so we have three curses as well. So as a result of their disobedience, they did not die immediately. So some people want to say, well, God obviously was lying, but that's not the case, right? We'll get into that. But we get three curses. Uh, We're going to skip the serpent's curse for now. The woman's curse is pain in childbirth and strife in her marriage, right? Uh, Can uh, women attest to childbirth is painful? Nobody would say that childbirth is painless except maybe a man who has not experienced it. But so we can say like that one existed, right? Uh, For the man, pain and toil of working the land and the promise of death, right? Men can attest working is not the thing that we like doing the most, right? Uh, And it's painful and it's toil and it takes a lot of work. So we get these curses, right? But you remember that this was a that these were blessings in the in chapter one. Right, the promise of seed, that was a blessing. But now we get a curse involved in it. Well, now we have pain when it comes to reproduction. Uh, The promise of land, this was a blessing, but now it's a burden because we're going to sweat over it. We're going to toil over it, right? So the sin has crept in and caused that good creation to grow rotten. Um, And then we get the curse of the serpent. And this one is so important for us, right? Um, this, this, this promise is really what the entire, entirety of the Bible is all about. So the curse of the serpent is God says, well, you'll lie on your belly. I don't, whatever. Uh, but then God says, um, the woman's offspring, you will, um, you will crush his, or you will hurt his heel, right? But he will crush your head. Um, and this becomes really important because you remember I, I told you the books of the Bible that I really enjoyed reading when I, when I first started reading the Old Testament, those were full of genealogies, right? And we're going to look at genealogies throughout the Old Testament. And the whole point of that is, remember, what are the Jews longing for? They're longing for Messiah. And that's why the genealogy is so important to them because they're tracing that genealogy back to this offspring of Eve. So the rest of the book of Genesis is all about this family line, right? That's going back to Eve. Uh, when we look at when we look at the the book of Kings, it's all about this this family line, right? David, all of that going back to David because David goes all the way back to Eve. And why is that? Because the promise of the Messiah is going to come through this bloodline. Um, and then we said death. Did they die immediately? They did not. But we see uh, the first, uh, we see death in three places in the, in the book of Genesis chapter 3. Uh, the first one uh, we see in verse 21. You've probably heard this before. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. 
At the beginning of Genesis chapter 3, when they sinned, what were they clothed in? Fig leaves. So God has now given them skins. Do you think that they were just skin laying in the ground? No, he obviously killed an animal, right? So we have death, we have bloodshed as a result of sin. There's been a sacrifice where Adam and Eve did not die, but some animal died in their place, and they're given this skin to cover them. This is the Passover foreshadow, right? The second thing that we see with, uh, with death, um, we see a separation from the tree of life, right? So now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. This implies that if there was no sin, we would all just eat of this tree of life and live forever, right? This tree of life, this is a theme that will be throughout the Bible. Uh, you'll read about the tree of life in Zephaniah, you'll, or Zechariah. You'll, you'll read about the tree of life in Ezekiel, right? You'll read about the tree of life when they're building the temple. You'll read about the tree of life in Revelation. The whole, the whole reason why you'll read about that is because the offspring of the woman is going to be the one that allows you to get back to that tree of life, right? So we're separated from that tree, and what are we separated from that tree by? A cherubim and a flaming sword, right? God is communicating that if you want to try and get back to this tree, you will face death because this cherubim, this guardian, is going to have a flaming sword, and there's no way that you're going to be able to defeat him, right? So that we also get a foreshadow that our Messiah, if we're going to get back to the tree of life, there has to be a death paid, right? We get this communication of a future substitution that will be paid by Jesus' blood. That Messiah will face that sword by hanging on the tree, right? Um, I love uh, the symbolism of the Old Testament. Um, I call it biblical sometimes. So a really biblical thing in the Bible is Genesis 3. We have the, the tree of life, right? If we eat of this fruit, we will live forever. But then when we look at the cross, we see death on the cross, right? And specifically, we'll read about it in Deuteronomy. Those who hang on a cross are cursed, right? So now we've gone from a tree of life. This is a blessing, Sin has turned this tree into a curse, right? Christ is dying on the cross, and this is the curse. Um, but he says to eat my body and drink my blood, right? That's the new covenant. And you imagine he's hanging on a, on a, on a tree. Uh, and so to eat the fruit of that tree is to have life, right? So Christ is going to face this sword, hang on this cross, and he's going to take the curse of the tree and turn it back into the tree of life, right? Where, we, where if we partake in the promise that he has given us, we can have this eternal life that was taken from us by sin, right? And that's what it means when Christ is going to crush the head of the serpent. So I'm going to close um, with Revelation 21. But I want to remind you what we talked about. We see God's word is true and without mistake. We can trust his promise, right? That's Genesis 1. What he says is going to happen. Um, he is incapable of lying, right? And as a result of that, he has to execute justice. So he says if we eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then we will die. They have to die. They have to or he's a liar, right? We understand that. If he does not kill them, then he's a liar, right? And they experience death, right? We will all experience that death. Um, but he also makes a promise of Messiah, right? Someone that will crush the head of the serpent. So if God has said in Genesis chapter 1 what he says is going to happen, right? Then we can trust when he makes a promise that it will happen. And we know that that Messiah has died on the cross for us, giving us the pathway. Um, but I love the, the future promise of Revelation 21. Because now our Messiah has saved us, but he has promised to return to take us home, right? And that's the promise that we wait for. So if God's word has been sufficient and uh, firm and absolute and without lie prior to this promise, then we could hold fast that this promise will, be, will come to fruition, right? It will be true. And Revelation 21, 3 through 4. So think about the context of what we just read. We have pain in childbirth. We have strife in our marriage. We have pain in work. We have death. Uh, Revelation 21, 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, right? 
So that's what was happening in Genesis 3, Genesis 2 and 3. We lived with God in the garden, but then we're separated from him by sin. And in Revelation 21, God is saying that the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them. This is a promise. And they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall that. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away, right? So if we can hold firm that what God has said in the Old Testament is true, then we can hold firm that what God is saying in the New Testament will also come to fruition. Um, And I hope that you guys will see that throughout as we read the Old Testament. But I'm going to pray for us and we'll get out of here. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you so much just for uh, the opportunity to come together just for the opportunity to discuss um, the beauty of your word and the promises that you've given us, Father. We are grateful that you uh, are a God that is incapable of lying and that you have made a promise to save us if we will believe that your Son is our Savior. And I pray, dear God, that we would all know that and that we would all submit to you. Uh, Just give us all safe travel home and uh, keep us warm. Amen.